Building performance is a growing industry nationwide. The rising cost of energy, increased interest in indoor air quality, ongoing demand for better comfort, and timeless concern for building durability require that we focus on building science more than ever. I'm Tony Oliver, Building Performance Manager at Lands Heating and Cooling. I'm a home energy rater, certified building analyst, and your host for today's program. If you'd like to join us in our mission to help make America energy independent, the first step is understanding energy. Well, hello, my name is David Burlingame, and I have, I'm from Burlingame Home Inspection and Performance, and I do home energy ratings for uh, new construction, for Energy Star, and for tax credits, and, you know, basically I rate new buildings, and I also do home inspections, I also do energy audits of existing structures to, uh, you know, find out what's the best method to, uh, you know, weatherize and save money with uh, your, uh, in, in your existing home. And right now, that's the bulk of my business has been coming from people who are interested in weatherization and doing the home energy audits, largely because there's so many great incentives from uh, the power company, Ameren IP Power, the Act on Energy program is giving great incentives for people to uh, insulate and air seal their homes. And also the city of Urbana is matching some of these incentives by 20%. So it's not uh, unusual to see, you know, th these incentives picking up, you know, up to, up to or even more than half of the cost of uh, air sealing and insulating your home. So we've been keeping pretty busy doing a lot of home energy audits in existing homes. And that's, uh, you know, I think it's kind of uh, some of the less glamorous aspects of doing you know home energy work but you know it's it's kind of the nuts and bolts that's where the big savings are right now to uh you know say how people save money in the home that they're already in you know and tony i heard him talking about uh you know how we get in the builders to build more efficient homes and that's that's definitely the great way to go because the best way to make a home energy efficient is right from the planning stage uh, but you know, once you have, once you own a home and you're living in it, there's a lot that can be done to make it more comfortable and more energy efficient and reduce your bills. And, um, so it involves some, uh, you know, getting in there and doing some home diagnostic work or some, uh, you know, some pretty fancy equipment. You know, we're pretty well trained. I, I have a BPI certification for building analyst and envelope shell, and I'm also certified by ResNet to do uh, home energy ratings. And uh, I'm also a licensed home inspector, so all these things go together. But um, we, uh, we use a number of tools uh, to, to uh, you know, figure out where to come in and, 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 uh, and, and fix your home for weatherization. Uh, we, I like to look at the whole home as a system. So we look basically study the whole home, everything from the windows to the heating and cooling system, but most importantly what we call the thermal envelope, which is the uh, you know the exterior interior exterior cladding of the house that, that, that protects the house from, from air infiltration and you know from heat loss from uh, thermal heat loss, you know, it's your insulation, your air infiltration. We gotta make sure that that's one smooth continuous um, <laughs> one smooth and continuous, uh, you know, envelope. That's why we call it an envelope. We want it to be continuous without any holes or gaps. So yeah, three of the main tools we use for um, doing home energy audits is use a blower door that we set up in the house, which depressurizes the house, and then we measure the amount of air that is leaking going through the fan at a certain pressure to, you know, it gives us a standard measurement of how much air is leaking through the house. And it also depressurizes the house to a level that we usually set at 50 pascals. So that's a, that's usually they say the equivalent uh, about of having like a 25 mile an hour wind against one wall. At that point, we, uh, I like to go around, go around the house and do what I call zone pressure testing with my uh, nanometer. This is basically measures air pressure. And with, uh, I go around with this and also with my infrared camera and we can find air leakage that's inside, you know, coming through the house while we're depressurizing. Cause that's usually the, for most houses, the biggest loss of energy comes from, uh, for, comes from air leakage, what we call air infiltration. 
And when we have the home depressurized, what we're looking for is air that's coming into the house from the outside. But in most cases, you know, in, when the house has its stands, especially in the winter months, we're looking for, you know, warm air that's escaping through the house. There's something called the stack effect, which causes uh, higher air pressure inside of the house, you know, at the top of the house from the warm air trying to escape at the top of the house. So, you know, what we focus on during our audits is usually the attic and the top of the house to try to seal up the top to keep the warm air from leaking out. And then the next most important area, or sometimes the more important area, depending on the cases, is uh, down around the ground level at what we call the rim joist or the band joist or the foundation, trying to keep the cold air that comes in through the basement. So the, the dynamics in a, in a cold winter day is you have the cold air that seeps in from the ground level more, and, uh, and, then, and then that air is heated by your, uh, by your heating system, and then it's heated up, and then it actually rises, you know, kind of like a balloon, and tries to escape through the top of the house. So that's usually our main line of attack to save, uh, save energies and, and prevent air infiltration and exfiltration is through the attic and through the basement. So, you know, this is, you know, we, we're kind of working against the stack effect. So we depressurize the house and then, you know, oftentimes I'll go along with the infrared camera and we'll look for air leaks and sometimes we'll see something like uh, a picture like that, which is air leakage coming down from the attic and moving down. Oftentimes, um, that I believe is on an inside wall. So you wouldn't think of, you know, being a lot of heat loss on your inside walls, but what happens is the, uh, the uh, you know, the air, that inside wall is attached to the attic, which is vented to the outside, so your, your warm heated air actually gets into that wall and then escapes through the attic. So one of the things we want to do is seal all the top plates in the attic, you know, to prevent that air from escaping. So. Right now, we're finding, you know, it's a gap on the inside wall on the top plate where it's allowing, allowing cold air to come in during the depressurization of the house, and we're seeing that with the infrared camera. And uh, like I said, we'll want to go up in the attic and we'll want to seal that gap. Uh, a lot of times, people have canister lights, and we'll see the cold air coming in through the canister lights. It'll look a lot like that. And those are oftentimes more difficult to repair. Sometimes I recommend we replace the whole lights if they're older. Otherwise, we have to like, kind of create a box or a seal with insulation. But some of these older lights you can't insulate over because they're not insulation, IC rated. That's called, that means uh, insulation contact. If they're IC rated, they can have contact with insulation. A lot of the older lights, usually the silver cans, they're not IC rated. And then the only thing to do is either replace them or um, you have to build a box around them to prevent the air infiltration. So a lot of times uh, they'll find air coming in through, this is through a baseboard. That's cold air coming in through a baseboard. In a, and that's, that was actually a newer house, but that's oftentimes because they didn't seal up what we would call the band joist in the house. Uh, there's, a, there's a a band that goes around the center of the house between the two separate floors that should be air sealed. And it's really real simple matter to air seal that while the house is under construction, but it's a much more difficult thing to do, you know, in a house in, in a retrofit case. But, you know, there, there's different methods we can do to, to prevent that, uh, that type of infiltration. But that's like I said, that's coming in from a band joist, and that's usually uh, a situation where, here I got an illustration of it. See, basically, the air is coming in between the, between, the, the, between the floor and the ceiling in the band joist, and then it's oftentimes just going straight through into the, into the, uh, into the ceiling area, and then it's coming out under the baseboard. And that, that's what we could see in that infrared picture. I was showing you before where we had sometimes, uh, we had cold air coming in from the attic into the inside walls, and that's a real common thing. So that's why, we, like I said, we want to seal up the top of these inside walls. 
And one of the things I do, like I said, with zone testing, is I'll actually put holes sometimes in some of the inside walls or some inside enclosed cavities. And this is a pressure reading uh, device called a nanometer. And I'll, you know, just put like an eighth of an inch hole and I'll stick this tube in there and we can, since we have the house depressurized, you know, I can, I can measure the air pressure inside of walls or inside cavities that aren't readily apparent to see if, you know, if the pressure is real low in those areas compared to the, uh, to what we have inside the house. That means that that's attached to the outside and we'll have to find a way to seal those up. This illustration shows different ways that interior walls and cavities uh, can connect to the attic or to the crawl space. Uh, a lot of times it's from, uh, from uh, you know, plumbing, holes that are made for plumbing, or oftentimes we find that there's dropped soffits in the kitchen or in the bathroom that are connected to the attic without any proper backing between them. So, a lot of times that these drop soffits are just connected in a way directly to the outdoor, outdoors and uh, you know we have to seal that up from the attic. A lot of most, a big part of our work usually involves working in the attic and here's, here's pictures of a lot of the things I'll see in the attic like here's a picture of just a hole that's made for electrical wiring that's going down in a wall and like I said, the, that wall is part of the top plate and that needs to be sealed up because you can see by the gray areas and in the insulation, that's, that, that, gray is, that gray stuff is just dirt that's coming in from, um, from, you know, just getting trapped by the insulation from the air that's escaping through that wall cavity and through that one hole. So just plugging up that one hole, that one hole is all, all winter long, is just a continuous vent for, you know, expensive warm air that you've, that's just, just escaping through there. And, uh, you know, this is, is, you know, nowadays, like maybe in the last five years, most builders are plugging up those holes, but even houses that are, you know, 10 years old or even less, we're finding they still have a lot of open holes like this up in the attic that were never sealed properly. Here's an interesting film that I had of, uh, I depressurized the house and I filled up the attic space with smoke, looking for, you know, places where the air would come down, looking for the smoke, how it came into the house. And here we have a drop soffit with a canister light, and that's smoke coming out of the attic and moving down these canister lights. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty vivid illustration of how closely connected these people are sitting at their kitchen counter, and, and that light above their head is just continuously leaking cold air, you know, up into the attic and out of the house. Air sealing the attic is usually where we get the most bang for the buck as far as, uh, um, you know, air savings. And then after, after the attic is suitably air sealed, usually we want to add more insulation because a lot of times there's just like fiberglass bats that are down on the floor of the attic and those allow, allow a lot of air just to pass in and out of. Here's a picture of a vi fiberglass bats that are just stuck on the uh, inside of like a knee wall in an attic and the, and the air pretty much without those being covered the air will just pass through there so on these vertical walls I might want to cover that up with Tyvek and on the horizontal surfaces we'll probably want to spray some uh, some cellulose insulation which actually does create it's not a tight air barrier, but it's a lot better than just the plain fiberglass. Yeah, here's a picture of an attic that's uh, being air sealed. Luckily, there's not, there wasn't insulation in this attic, but you see they, they, they have, uh, they put an insulation around the canister light because that's an IC rated canister light and they're insulating the top plates along the outside walls and the inside walls. So. Um, see, this is a properly air sealed attic. I don't know if this is new construction because I didn't take that picture. But, you know, and then, and then, and then you put, you know, I would recommend at least 14 to 18 inches of cellulose insulation on top of that. One of the things I see a lot in this area, builders built a lot of houses on crawl spaces. And until you know, it's until just a couple years ago, the build, you know, building code said that you had to have those crawl spaces needed to be ventilated. This, this crawl space, they, they did a good job. They put insulation 
on the walls and they put insulation, foam insulation on the rim joists, which we like to see, but then they have this vent, which even, you know, you're supposed to close them in the winter time, but they don't close very well. So that's still just allowing cold air to uh, come in in the winter time or hot air to escape. And then in the summertime, the idea for these vents is that you're supposed to open those up in the summer to dry out the crawl spaces. But, you know, uh, studies have shown that, especially in this climate, when it's hot and humid, they actually bring in more, more, more moisture than they actually remove. So then you can end up in a situation like this. This there is a picture of a crawl space that I was in last summer. We had that hot, humid streak going, and this crawl space, it was just soaking wet. And they actually had insulation up on the ceilings that was soaking wet, and it was falling down, and you can see the water dripping off of the, uh, the um, ductwork. Because I'm pretty sure I could see that this hadn't been wet like this for a long time. So I'm sure that the, the house was for sale and they probably, it was super hot and humid. So they probably turned the thermostat down to 65 degrees. And I mean, this whole basement was just soaking wet like that. And that's, that's you know, allowing warm, moist air into a, uh, into, a, in, in, into a crawl space is just bringing in a lot of humidity. So what we're wanting to do now, or what I'm usually recommending in most crawl spaces that I see is we seal up those vents just, uh, just like that, you know, just seal them up with some foam and then basically encapsulate them. We want to uh, get a nice clean layer of plastic on the ground and have the plastic sealed up to the walls at the piers and at the walls because that also prevents a lot of moisture and a lot of you know, soil gases, particularly radon, which is a big issue in this area, from getting into these houses. So, I mean, that's the type of crawl space I like to see, and it's gonna not only save a lot of energy, but it's going to make the house much more pleasant and livable. And then also the, the floors are gonna be warmer too, because a lot of times these floors aren't insulated, and if that crawl space is cold, you know, you got a cold floor, so this way you have a more warm, comfortable floor and it'll be a uh, you know, more comfortable, healthier, safer house with, uh, with uh, you know, and it's gonna save you a lot of energy. Uh, a lot of times we want people to seal up the rim joists. You know, I mentioned the rim joist, that's the joist on the outside of the house. And a lot of times people will just put in these pieces of, pieces of fiberglass bat insulation. And then the air is going to move, go right through there. You can see from the brown area, that's where the air is moved through the fiberglass. So the, it's, it's not doing anything to prevent air from coming through, but also what it's doing is it's causing moisture to accumulate on the backside of the fiberglass. So we got mold building up in the basement, just like here's down in the basement where the plastic's not sealed up in the crawl space. They got, they got the plastic down, which is good, but this plastic, should be taped up and sealed because at the outer edge you see all this, here's some fuzzy mold and here's some black mold. It's all, I don't know necessarily what that is, but some of those molds can be really unhealthy. If nothing else, it shows there's a lot of moisture there and uh, you know, there's a lot of people have a lot of problems with mold. So uh, yeah, working in the crawl spaces in the attics, that's where most of our work is. We also like to test out the the uh, duct system, because a lot of times I was showing you in that one uh, crawl space, the ducts for the furnace are actually running through that space, and uh, they have, if they're oftentimes not sealed and not insulated at all. So there's huge heat losses there, there's condensation, there's mold growth in the ducts. So if you encapsulate the crawl space like we talked about, you don't have to really worry that much about the duct leakage. I would still recommend that having, you know, the ducts maybe sealed up with some mastic, but uh, yeah, you know, sometimes the insulator will want to spray the whole duct system with an inch of uh, single part foam, but you know, that can cost upwards of $2,000 and just going down there with a hundred dollars worth of mastic and a, and a brush and spending a few hours sealing up the seams is oftentimes just as effective if you have your crawl space properly sealed. Anyway, I'm being told that I'm running out of time here. So, you know, that's just kind of a brief overview of kind of what we do, but you know, doing an energy audit is, uh, it's a great way to get started and it's, it's a great way to, 
you know, it's, it's good to have a real plan when you start your weatherization because a lot of times there's a lot of very simple, inexpensive things that can be done first and then you move on to the more expensive things or the more elaborate things. But we work with you, you know, we work with your budget. And, and sometimes it, it's, it doesn't take a whole lot of money to do a lot of major weatherization work. And then, you know, and it's also important that we time things. You know, you do some things before others. You want to do your air sealing before you put more insulation in. So, I mean, I mean, a lot of the times I like people, I'll encourage people to turn this into a do-it-yourself job, you know, and I can give them a lot of guidance and, you know, do-it-yourself work and you can save a lot of money that way. And if I supervise the work, I can still give you your act on energy rebates and credits for that. So, okay, well, hopefully maybe I'll have a chance to talk some more at length about some of these things, but, uh, yeah, my name is David Burlingame, Burlingame Home Performance. Hello, my name is Andy Robinson. I'm a building engineer, uh, energy engineer with the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center in Champaign-Urbana. We're in a, a group out of the University of Illinois Architecture Department who uh, we do free energy audits and energy related uh, advice for businesses and public buildings throughout the state. And I was going to present a little bit today on energy audits in Illinois buildings. Uh, just a quick overview, we'll talk about the current state of the energy in the, in the state and in the country. Then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what CDEC does, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center and its services. We'll talk about utility incentives, a little bit about federal tax incentives, and then questions as they come up. Uh, starting off here, we have a graph of the Illinois electricity prices from about 1970 through the current day. Uh, and just as a general trend, electricity prices go up. Uh, with, with time, that's a, that's, a, that's a known fact. They, they stayed pretty level and even dropped off a little bit uh, in, uh, in about 1980 to the 2000s or so. But recently, electricity prices have been rising again. Um, usually 10 cents a kilowatt hour is a pretty good number to keep in mind. We're, we're more in the range of 11 to 12 cents for residential. Uh, still, commercial is more like 9 or 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, looking at gas prices next. Uh, Gas prices in Illinois, natural gas prices have uh, continued to rise uh, as they have throughout the whole country. Uh, there's actually a, a little bit of a uh, dip lately. The uh, natural gas prices have uh, been coming down. We've had a lot more supply in, uh, in the national market. So uh, due, to, due to new technologies of, uh, of, ga of gathering natural gas, fracking technologies that uh, allow us to reach natural gas deposits that we otherwise weren't able to get to. Uh, there's some questions about what the environmental aspects are of uh, any new technology of, uh, of getting, of mining and drilling. So that's a, that's a bit of a question. But in general, again, gas prices are rising. Uh, a general number to keep in mind, I usually think about a dollar a therm uh, for gas prices. It's usually a little bit above, a little bit below, but that's a, that's a pretty fair number to use. Uh, just a quick glance at the, the state of energy in the United States as a whole. Uh, it's kind of on the left of this chart are arrows coming in, so that's energy flows coming into the United States. On the right of the chart are energy flow going out of the United States to what sectors it goes to. So looking at the right first, uh, generally uh, energy flow goes to residential buildings, commercial buildings, industrial sector, and then transportation. And it's roughly, you could think about it about a third to each of those categories. Transportation is about a third, industrial is about a third, residential and commercial together are about another third. Uh, of the of the energy use, a very small amount gets sent to exports. That's shown on the top of the graph, uh, and uh, on the left side of the graph we have uh, energy coming in. So we have coal, natural gas, oil, uh, a little bit of nuclear, uh, very small amount electrical or of, uh, very small amount of renewable energy, and then petroleum at the bottom, and then imports at the very bottom. Um, sorry, both of those two, petroleum and uh, other imports, are, are imports. So about 30% uh, about of the energy that comes into the country is imported. Uh, the other 60% or so comes from, uh, comes from domestic sources. So it's interesting to, to consider that uh, we do have quite a lot of domestic energy production. And even the imports, a lot of it comes from nearby neighbors uh, coming from Canada. A lot of oil comes from Canada and, uh, and, uh, and, and South America as well. But. Uh, but just thinking in general, uh, looking at where the energy goes in the country, uh, residential and commercial, those are some of the areas that, uh, that CDAC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, tries to focus on, which is shown in the pie chart here. Uh, we're looking at uh, consumption by different sectors, residential buildings, commercial buildings, transportation and industry. 
Uh, so CDAC tries to focus in on, on the commercial buildings, uh, which is in this chart is about 18 or 20 percent of the energy use for the country. And uh, we, do, we get into industrial a little bit with some of the businesses we work with uh, as far as energy efficiency and industrial processes. Uh, in general though, buildings in the U.S. are responsible for 50 percent of CO2 emissions, 40 percent of CFC emissions, although those have gone down a lot over time as we curtail CFCs. And then, uh, but buildings increasingly use more energy each year. Even uh, high-tech high advanced buildings do. All right, so these two pie charts on the left shows commercial buildings, so building energy statistics for commercial buildings. On the right is a little bit easier pie chart to read, that's residential buildings. So residential buildings make sense. You can think of about four or five things that use energy in a residential building. Heating in the wintertime in Illinois, we're pretty much heating dominated uh, climate, especially in northern Illinois. So heating in, uh, in, in residential buildings makes sense. Air conditioning in the summertime. Water heating, there's quite a lot of showers that happen in residential buildings. Uh, refrigerators are a small percent, 5%, and then lighting is another, is about a quarter, so lighting and appliances, 26%. But of those, of those pie slices for residential, uh, space heating, water cooling, and lighting and appliances are the big ones. They're pretty easy to think about. Commercial buildings on the left-hand side of the chart are a little bit more complex, uh, more complicated things going on in a commercial building. Space heating, heating again, about a third, uh, maybe 30% to 40%. So space heating is a big component in commercial buildings. Uh, space cooling, again, not very large. In, uh, in Illinois, we don't have a huge cooling demand, although some buildings might have more computers and more lighting and might have more cooling, therefore. Uh, lighting is usually 20 or 25 percent uh, of energy use in a building. Um, and then we have a lot of smaller items. We have ventilation, which wasn't in, uh, in homes. Most homes aren't ventilated, but ventilation is a pretty large portion in, uh, in buildings, in commercial buildings. Uh, water heating is a smaller portion now. Instead of uh, being 20 percent, we're down to 8 percent. So water heating is not necessarily as big of a factor in commercial buildings. Uh, then some of these that are getting a little hard to read are refrigerator, cooking, office equipment, computers. So some of these smaller pie slices are just little pieces of the puzzle. And those can be smaller or larger depending on how the building is using energy. But uh, that's one of the things an energy audit tries to determine, is tries to determine where energy is being used and what, part, what, what magnitude is it being used in and how much money are you spending on different, different parts of your building, different aspects of your building, and then where's the potential for savings. For instance, on these charts, I, I wouldn't necessarily go after water heating in a commercial building right away. I would look at space heating. I would look at uh, lighting. Uh, I would look at maybe space cooling. All the space cooling is not, not as big of an item either. Um, but some of these other computers and some of these other smaller slices add up to be, uh, to be big savings as well. All right, talking about CDAC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. Uh, this is uh, run out of the Building Research Council here at the University of Illinois. The Building Research Council has been around for quite a long time, uh, dating back to the 60s and possibly before, doing research on homes, weatherization, uh, continues to do weatherization research. and. Uh, and, and, and CDEC is, a, is an offshoot of that we, where we focus, we have a grant to focus on, uh, on commercial, industrial, municipal schools and colleges. Uh, we're, CDEC is sponsored by the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity in Illinois. Uh, we're funded through, a, our grant funding comes through the Energy Efficiency Portfolio Standard, which requires utility companies to reduce energy demand. So it's a state law that requires the major utility companies, so Ameren and ComEd right now, uh, to reduce their energy demand, to reduce uh, to, to energy efficiency is a big portion of that, and, uh, and the education component is one thing that CDEC tries to offer, education and audits. Um, CDEC has assessed more than 700 facilities in about the five or seven years that we've been doing this, and uh, we're over 55 million square feet throughout the state. CDEC services are broken into sort of four general categories. We have level one through four. Uh, level one would be over the phone assistance with energy related items. Uh, it would be pre-screening. Uh, it would be general support. We have an 800 number so people might call in and just ask for a general, general question or um, they, might, uh, they might ask about a certain technology and just, just want uh, some resources, maybe some web-based resources that we can point them to. Uh, or they might be asking about incentives and grants and we could point them to those questions easily. Um, sometimes also very, very small clients, so we say clients under maybe 10,000 square feet, uh, we try to sort of pre-screen those and maybe handle those over the phone. So uh, we, we try to aim at more of the middle-sized businesses and public buildings. Uh, sometimes if a one-room uh, library calls up 
and is interested in energy audits. It's, it's a little bit tricky to drive all the way across the state and spend time auditing a one-room library, but there's some good advantages that you can have in an energy audit still. So we try to treat that a little bit more like a residential audit and maybe encourage them to, uh, if they have an insulation problem or, or a problem that could be easily handled under, under one of the four or five categories that homes usually fall under, uh, then they could maybe look for a residential contractor to help them with those items. But uh, a lot of the items can be handled over the phone, lighting, uh, heating, uh, air conditioning, and maybe computers and plugs. Uh, those would be the main items that would be in a small business usually. Um, and large businesses are where it gets a little bit more complicated. So a level two audit would be, uh, we would uh, provide, uh, we'll do a, a walkthrough of the facility, so a morning or an afternoon walkthrough. Uh, so not a terribly in-depth audit, but a, a walkthrough audit to try to find, uh, find the state of the building, the state of energy use currently, and then uh, find out where the potential for savings is. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the floor plans, we'll look at the, the bills for an energy, the energy bills for a building, we'll try to, uh, before we even go on site, we'll look at the plans and bills and, uh, and try to get a feel for how much energy per square foot a building is using. And energy per square foot is a good, a good way, or dollars per square foot is another way to think about it, uh, for how much energy a building is using and kind of benchmark yourself versus other buildings. So we try to do that uh, early on. Then uh, level three assistance is a, bit, is a bit more involved than level two assistance. It might involve more computer modeling. It might involve uh, more time, more in-depth analysis. We'll look at uh, life cycle cost analysis of how much, how much, not only how much energy you're saving with different measures that we recommend, which we would do in a level two, but then also how much, how much it might cost, estimates of how much it might cost to implement those energy saving measures and, uh, and to, to know where to focus, uh, focus energies first and where to focus uh, retrofits first. Then, uh, and then go out and get quotes from that point and get, uh, get solid official energy quotes or uh, implementation quotes. But uh, we'll try to give, give ballpark numbers in a level three audit. Um, we'll, we'll also uh, do more detailed recommendations usually. And, and that could be, uh, the idea with these audits is that that's a, a piece of paper, it's a document that you can take to either a bank to say, these are some good recommendations that uh, we'd like to get a loan for or maybe you could take it to a contractor and say these, these group of people recommended I look into, into uh, new lighting and maybe talk to a lighting contractor about what the, what the cost would be for the quote for there or, or what their idea of an estimate is. Sometimes we even uh, will be uh, an estimate uh, to sort of a third party verification of a contractor's estimate of savings. Uh, level four assistance is really just follow up on any of the previous level assistances. Uh, so, if, so we try to follow up with projects continually and ask if there are any uh, questions that they have ongoing. Are there any ways that uh, the energy savings measures could be clarified? Are there any ways that we could do better energy saving measures? Or have they, have they implemented these measures or different measures? And can we learn from them sometimes? Uh, so ongoing support and implementation assistance. Going on, we have uh, in a, in a level two and a level three audit, I've mentioned some of these steps, but uh, again, step one would be a bill analysis, looking at electricity and natural gas. Step two, a site inspection, looking for uh, how and where energy is consumed. Step three, identifying energy savings measures. Uh, step four, model the building with computer energy software. So we'll use Train Trace or free software called eQuest. Uh, so that'll be in a level three, uh, three uh, visit or a level three audit, we would do more detailed computer modeling. Step five would be uh, input those energy savings measures into a model to calculate the potential savings. So uh, looking at those in spreadsheets to, to see what the uh, potential savings would be and then sort of ranking the, the savings potential by, uh, by the most potential. Step six, we'll write up a report explaining the recommendations and, and summarizing those energy savings. And then that, doc that document can be something that, uh, that stays with the facility and, uh, and can be a useful tool. A typical CDEC audit. Uh, so uh, typically, uh, we'll see cost savings of anywhere from 17% to 40%. Uh, sort of in that 30% range is a sweet spot. In most buildings, it seems like uh, it's pretty straightforward to be able to come up with some savings in about a 30% range of, uh, of savings. The, uh, we'll usually look at uh, the average IRR of uh, our recommendations uh, is generally around uh, 18 to 47%. So somewhere, again, you could say 30% is another average IRR number. Uh, so the internal rate of return, which is uh, the finances, uh, what, the, what the payback is over time, uh, looking at, uh, looking at the, the life cycle cost, not just uh, the upfront cost, but looking at the ongoing cost throughout the whole project and throughout uh, the 10 or 5 or 10 or 20 years that a, a measure might last. 
Uh, we also look at then, uh, so the average square footage for a standard building is 11,000 square feet to 88,000 square feet or so. Again, we try to do buildings over about 10,000 square feet, uh, sort of a general rule of thumb. And, uh, and somewhere in that range of uh, 20 to 50,000 square feet is probably a sweet spot. We do, on the other hand, we do schools that are uh, fairly large lately. We've been doing some uh, quarter million square foot schools, 300,000 square foot schools, uh, and some factories we've gone to are very large uh, quarter million square foot factories uh, that, uh, or manufacturing facilities. Which, but that would be on the, on the limit of, uh, those, those are starting to get to be pretty large clients. Uh, photos here, we just have photos of uh, standing on top of a large building in Chicago. We always like to get a, a nice uh, scenery photo from on top of a large building. In the center we have uh, some engineers looking at a bank of uh, furnaces in a mechanical room. And then on the right we have uh, a, uh, an example of a, uh, of a water treatment plant uh, that we have in, uh, sometimes we do more, more industrial facilities like water treatment. All right, uh, I like to look at data. I'm an engineer, uh, so I like to look at data in graph form. The, here's a graph of uh, this, the, about the 55 schools that uh, CDEC has looked at, K through 12 schools. And this graph is ranked in order of uh, energy per square foot. So on the left is uh, the least energy per square foot, so a, a very good performing school. On the right is a very poor performing school with the high energy per square foot. And uh, one thing I'll note about uh, some of these schools is it's not always clear which schools have air conditioning and which schools have heating, just from glancing at this graph. Uh, sorry, which schools have air conditioning and which schools don't have air conditioning. So air conditioning is not necessarily the biggest item that will use energy in a school. Uh, it really depends on how the systems are operated, uh, heating and lighting and air conditioning, and, uh, and, and really how the, how the building is operated and maintained. There's some schools on the left-hand side. The other thing is that new schools versus old schools might not be the deciding factor. Uh, we see old schools that are performing very well, and a lot of the new schools that we see are performing some of the worst. The, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the two top schools that we have here, which really are data outliers, they, they really use a lot of energy, both of those schools have systems that are just running 24-7. And uh, here's an example of, uh, of one of those. We have uh, gas usage going over the course of about four years on the top. And, uh, and gas usage uh, rises in the wintertime, drops off in the summertime, rises in the wintertime, and it follows that, uh, that, that line, that heating degree day line. But then on the, in the last year or so, this school has just gone crazy with the amount of gas that they've used. Uh, the, their systems are running in the summer, got the boiler's running in the summer, it's fighting the air conditioning, and uh, it's running flat out in the winter all night long, all weekend long. Uh, so this is a good example of a broken school. And likewise, that, that is paralleled similarly in the electricity graph below it. You see the electricity was being pretty reasonable, but then on the, uh, in the recent year, it's gone kind of haywire. So these were things right away that, uh, that point to a problem in a school, in a facility. All right, the top 10 recommendations that we have, uh, just going down a quick list, we've mentioned some of them already. If efficient lighting, lighting is usually very quick payback, a couple year payback, six month to three year payback. So switching from T12 to T8 fluorescent lighting, for instance. Uh, is a very inexpensive and very energy saving thing to do. You could also put in LED lighting, which might be about as efficient as T8 lighting, but it's about the most expensive thing you could do. So we see very little of that uh, until that lighting becomes less expensive than uh, fluorescent and more efficient than fluorescent, which it isn't at the moment. Uh, weatherization, air sealing, number two. Number three, commissioning and retro commissioning. Uh, number four, temperature setbacks. Uh, so turning the thermostat down at night. Number five, energy, uh, energy efficient boilers and furnaces. Uh, again, in Illinois, we have a lot of uh, heating use, so going from an 80% efficient to a 90 or 95% efficient furnace or boiler is a very good uh, thing to do, especially, especially it's good to do before it breaks, uh, before it becomes an emergency. Go ahead and make the plans for change out, even if you can't afford change out right now, then, uh, then if it does happen to break unexpectedly, which it usually will be unexpected, then you can go ahead and change it to a high efficiency system. Number six, high efficiency cooling. Oops, let's go back to that. Number seven, ventilation adjustments. How much outdoor air is coming into a space? That can sometimes be uh, an enormous amount of energy in a broken building. Number eight, electrical motor controls. Variable frequency drives on large motors is a great thing to do in industrial and uh, larger commercial buildings. Uh, number nine and 10, insulation upgrades and glazing upgrades. Windows and ins insulation are, are put last on the list because they are very expensive things to do. And while they might have good energy potential, uh, especially if you have an uninsulated building to start with, they are usually very, very difficult to do and very expensive. So we don't see people doing a whole lot of that. Uh, just utilities incentives really briefly. ComEd and Ameren help fund our program. Uh, they also have uh, incentives. Uh, ComEd's uh, Smart Ideas program. Ameren, Illinois has the Act on Energy program. 
Uh, both of those have incentives for lighting, for controls, for motors, for all the things that we've been talking about today. Uh, the Illinois uh, Municipal Electrical Cooperatives have incentives, so if you're in a co-op area, there are incentives available there. NICOR have gas incentives, uh, and a note about that is that full gas incentives are going to be state law in uh, June of 2011, so there will be efficiency programs for gas as well coming up soon. Uh, prescriptive examples are uh, going from LED exit signs to uh, going from an old, old, an old exit sign to an LED exit sign. It's one of the few times we recommend LEDs because you can put red LEDs in usually and uh, that'll receive a $20 per sign incentive. Usually that'll also save about $30 a year, so every sign saves about $30 a year. Uh, also at the bottom, a custom incentive an example is server virtualization. You can get seven cents per kilowatt hour uh, in that first year uh, for doing something like server virtualization. Again, uh, utility incentives, federal tax incentives, don't even really matter to talk about much because they're very, very hard to do. We've seen very few clients get the dollar eighty a square foot for the, for the EPAC 2005. Uh, it requires very in-depth energy modeling, and it requires engineering analysis. Uh, none of our small clients have done that, or medium-sized clients. Maybe some large clients can, but it's a very high bar to, attack, to tackle. And finally, we'll end up here with a question, or uh, with, uh, with a sheet of uh, a photo of the uh, Illinois Solar Decathlon House at the University of Illinois campus. Uh, it's not our facility exactly, but it's a very nice uh, poster of what, uh, what buildings can do to be super energy efficient with solar across the whole roof. We have part of our team here in the photo and uh, contact information. So if anybody was interested in uh, free energy audit or energy advice, feel free to call our 1-800 number or look at us online at cdac.org. And thank you very much for your time. I'm Tony Oliver. I'm the building scientist with Lands Heating and Cooling in Champaign, Illinois. I'm a HERS rater. That means that I'm certified to place the Energy Star label on new homes. And I'm also a, a an energy analyst, a building analyst certified by the Building Performance Institute, as well as a building shell professional certified by BPI as well. Buildings play a critically important part in our lives. It's where we live out our lives, where we raise our kids, where we do our best work. And uh, having buildings perform the best way that we can get them to perform is very important. There are some very common defects that we see in homes that get repeated again and again and again because of the way we build homes. So I'd like to first talk a little bit about the history of why we build homes the way we do. In the world of consulting we say that things are the way they are because they got that way and they got that way for a reason. Uh, the main reason really stems from 1941. When America went to war against Japan, millions of American men joined up into the service and went off to serve their country, but not all of them carried a rifle. There were a lot of support services needed. In fact, it was necessary to provide housing and facilities for all the military operations all around the world. And so that's where this man comes in. This is William Levitt of New York City. And uh, he come from a family that was traditional builders uh, his family's company is called Levitt and Sons. They were based in New York City and uh, mostly built homes but some commercial properties. And because of his construction background, he was drafted into the United States Navy Corps of Engineers, uh, what we call the Seabees. And the Seabees, it fell upon them to do most of the construction for the military around the world. Uh, and sometimes very rapid construction as the battle lines moved forward and back. To make this possible, it was necessary to build buildings out of the same set of blueprints over and over again using interchangeable components and materials and methods that uh, could, um, could be repeated, that could be uh, men could be trained to do the same procedure over and over again and get construction to be done very quickly. Levitt became convinced that this was the method of construction that would be needed if America was going to be able to handle the large influx of GIs coming back from the war needing housing and places of business. When he returned home, he convinced his father, the owner of Levitt and & Sons, and his brother, the architect, to design homes that were very simple, that were very easy to construct, that could be built on little lots in subdivided neighborhoods, that is, land that had been staked out purposefully for the purpose of development with new roads and storm sewers and 
Oh, uh, and the whole nine yards. So what we get is Levittown, New York, the first suburb in America, and uh, the first planned community, really, uh, of, uh, of any consequence in America with houses that are all stamped out one like the next. We call this cookie cutter construction where one house is built and then hundreds or thousands of houses are built exactly like it. Very often, as in the case of Levittown, one right next to another, right next to another with very similar features and options. And so that has become the story of America. Now all of our neighborhoods look this way. Property is picked out in the original case of Levittown, onion and potato fields were uh, subdivided and developed into a modern community. That's how we subdivide and develop our communities. A uh, model home will be built and then multiple homes will be stamped out again and again off the same design. What this means is that if a defect, particularly in our case an energy efficiency defect, is created in the model home, then that defect will be repeated again and again in all the subsequent new homes. So this illustration demonstrates how air can leak into or leak out of a house. Uh, conditioned air that be it heated air or air conditioned air that we are paying to treat gets leaked out of the house costing us money and air leakage can come into the house bringing humidity, other forms of contamination and that kind of humidity can settle out into moisture problems that lead to mold, termites, and rot. So when we have a defect existing in our model home that gets repeated over and over again, energy auditors like myself who inspect homes frequently will see them again and again. Here's an example of a plumbing stack, a pipe that uh, penetrates from the heated part of the house into the attic, which is outdoors. And this pipe moves through a shaft in the wall or a space between two walls that is just opened up to the attic. And very often I can reach down my whole arm into that cavity and I can feel the temperature difference from the attic on down into the house. And so during the hot summer months, uh, warm humid air is leaking into our cold air conditioned house. Of course, when that humid air hits that cold surface, inside the house that uh, can condense, create water deposition, rot, mold, termites, and other building problems, building durability issues. Here we have a furnace flue that uh, moves up through a similar shaft. Again, wide open. I can just put my arm right down in there. And that's leaking heated or cooled air right out of the house throughout the year, leaking contaminated air into the house. And when we block these off, we need to block them off uh, with some kind of fire resistant material. In this case, I would probably use sheet metal and then I would caulk around any remaining gaps with heat resistant muffler caulk or fire resistant intumescent caulk. But uh, really closing up the gaps in a building is fairly simple. The most expensive defects are the biggest holes that are the cheapest and easiest to seal up. It's when we get down to the little fine cracks that we can spend a lot of money trying to get a small amount of improvement, but virtually every house has penetrations in the attic and in the walls where electric boxes, electric wiring, plumbing passes from the heated or cooled portion of the house to the exterior, the attic. And uh, these can be very, very simple to seal up just with common caulk, or insulation foam or some other methods. Now before 1974, 1973, the energy crisis that was caused by the uh, Yom Kippur War between Israel and its enemies in the early 1970s, before that time energy was very very cheap and those of us who are old enough remember the gas lines and the brownouts that followed during the energy crisis and the higher prices for energy and this is when we really begin to see the price of natural gas going up dramatically rising very very quickly through the 1970s following falling briefly during the 1990s 
but still to levels three times greater than before and rising again in recent years. So if your home was insulated during the energy crisis or even during the 80s or 90s, you may be able to justify adding more insulation to the attic of your home because as the price for heat goes up, the justification for adding more insulation is improved. So here we have a <coughs> of an illustration of uh, an installer adding cellulose insulation to an attic. Cellulose insulation is basically recycled newspapers that are treated with boric acid that makes the insulation fire resistant and bug resistant. And it has uh, very good thermal properties and very good air sealing properties and, and is quite affordable. When it's installed correctly, it will cover the wooden members that are in the ceiling and prevent heat from escaping through conduction through those members and should have a depth of, we hope, at least 11 inches or an R value of R38 or more. So uh, cellulose is the material that uh, we choose and that we use at Lands Heating and Cooling. Another common energy loss uh, area in a home is what we call baseload. That is lighting, refrigeration, other activities that we do with energy that are consistent throughout the year. Lighting is the best example. So fluorescent lighting, of course, saves a significant amount of money over the traditional Edison lamps that will be slowly phased out of the marketplace. But we would like to change all of our traditional Edison lamps to uh, fluorescent lighting. Very often these compact fluorescent lamps, and when we change those out, the cost savings can be significant. We at Lance Heating and Cooling have done a study of these cookie cutter homes throughout Champaign County. And we've identified about seven. I, I want to just talk about a couple of them here. There's the, uh, the typical tri-level, split-level home where you've got one floor that hits in the middle of two other floors. And these can have some energy defects that we see repeated over and over again. There's a shaft wall that uh, often leaks air directly into that downstairs attic where the, the different floors all come together. Also in this example, we've got an exposed floor where the upstairs kind of hangs out over midair. Mid Those are often very poorly insulated. And uh, of course, uh, in addition to that, the attics and uh, the electrical systems, heat and cooling systems in these homes need to be sealed up just the same way they do in virtually any house. So in our study of uh, our study home, we found that uh, our study home spent $2,433 a year in energy costs. Once we did the improvements, including air sealing the penetrations between the home and the attic and uh, insulating, adding insulation to the attic floor eight inches and replacing the existing lighting with fluorescent lighting, we went from $2,433 a year to $2,009 a year. That's a savings of $374. And after the incentives from our uh, local utility supported uh, energy efficiency program known as Act on Energy, the total cost of the repairs came to 3,490, a simple payback of just nine years. Now the monthly savings are $31.17, and if a person borrowed all of the money needed to make the repairs with zero money down at 6%, they would have to pay the bank $20.92 per month. That's $20.92 to the bank instead of $31.17 to the utility. So it's easy to see that energy efficiency improvements cost nothing and in fact save a small amount of money while providing improved building durability by guarding against mold and rot and termites while improving your general air quality and, uh, and improving um, comfort in your home. Probably the second most common house in Champaign County is this split-level uh, 
double split level home with a tuck under garage underneath. So the typical energy defects in this home are similar to other split level homes with shaft walls that connect to the attic as well as cantilevered floors that hang out over midair and a tuck under garage that is usually poorly insulated losing energy through there and also allowing carbon monoxide to enter the house from cars being warmed up in the garage. Not all of these uh, split level homes have tuck under garages, although that is fairly typical. In this example, our uh, model home spent $1,436 on energy. And after we went on with the improvements at this home, insulating the exposed cantilevered floors and insulating the floor above the garage, as well as air sealing the penetrations in the attic like we should do at any home, adding insulation to the attic floor and replacing lighting with fluorescent lighting, we went from $1,436 a year to $1,062 per year. That's an annual savings of $424. And the total cost of repairs after incentives from Act On Energy, $3,900. $68, a simple payback of less than 10 years. Again, the monthly savings were $35.33, and if a person borrowed all the money with zero money down and 6% interest, then they would pay the bank $23.79. That's $23.79 to the bank compared with $35.33 to the utility, an obvious savings and an improvement, especially if you have an exposed floor ab above the garage in air quality, in this case, particularly carbon monoxide related, as well as comfort. Our final example is this home. This was built by a large company called Weller Homes. Uh, National Home is another large company that stamped out literally probably millions of homes around the United States. A very simple design. Again, these little but very simple houses have some very common energy defects. They have attached garages very often, uh, but otherwise the energy defects in this home are typical of all homes. Shafts that allow plumbing to go from the heated space to the unheated space. Um, exhaust flues <clears throat> from the water heater and the furnace. Electrical penetrations and so on. We made improvements to this home, air sealing the connections to the attached garage, the penetrations between the home and the attic, and uh, we added insulation to the attic floor, replacing existing lighting with fluorescent lighting. The model home began by spending $1,464 a year on energy, and after making those improvements, went to $1,014 per year for a savings of $460. The repairs cost $1,950 after the incentives from Act On Energy for a simple payback of less than four and a half years. That's monthly savings of $38.33 versus $11.69 paid to the bank if all the money was borrowed, financed at 6% with zero money down. So it's easy to see that energy efficiency doesn't cost, it pays, and it pays back not just in money, but also in the comfort and the, the air quality, the benefits, the, the job site productivity, the, the things that we buy energy for so that we can live better lives and enjoy our time at home. I hope this has been beneficial to you. And uh, very happy to answer questions. Email uh, Tony at landsinc.com and uh, we will cover more of these issues in, in future episodes.